I don't think it ever enters, you know, the people who are saying we want to levy a tax, I don't think it ever enters their minds that because, you know, Queen Elizabeth is on the coins, that's what, you know, if you want to use those coins, then you have to abide by Queen Elizabeth's right. taxes. I don't think it ever enters their mind. Really, it just, it's a matter of you have stuff. We want that stuff. We have guns. You don't. You have to give us some of your stuff to spend on what we want to do. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by Stealth EX, an instant exchange where privacy is the top concern. Go to StealthEX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making Stealth EX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Nick Watts, theologian, Monero contributor, and author of the book Taxation is Slavery The Biblical Case for Libertarian Politics. The two discuss the state of Monero adoption in Australia, how Christianity aligns with the ideals of digital cash taxation and the fiat system as a form of slavery, tactical pacifism, natural law and property rights, the morals of agorism and mass disobedience, the religious aspects of the different crypto communities, and much more. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Nick, what's going on, man? Uh, not a whole lot. Been, it's 8 a.m. here, and it's very, very warm. I mean, yeah, playing in the yard with the kids. Beautiful. Beautiful. Where, where are you? Where, 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 what can you tell us of where you are? You don't have to give uh, to you from Southeast Queensland, Australia. Beautiful, man. I have yet to make it anywhere near there. Yeah, I have yet to make it anywhere near kind of the, the Americas. <laughs> okay. It's definitely something I'd like to do. Yeah, the closest I've, I've got is... I guess the Philippines and, and Thailand. We did Hawaii for our honeymoon. That was, uh, yeah, technically in the United States briefly. Okay. How far, how far a trip was that for you from there? Uh, I'm trying to remember now. It wasn't all that far. I think it was maybe, uh, I'll remember all wrong, maybe nine hours. Oh, okay, that's not bad. Yeah, so I think it's like almost halfway or something. It's really not that far. So what's the, what's the Monero scene like? Whoa, what's the Monero scene like over there? I mean, um, I, I've, I've spoken to quite a few people throughout the years that are that are from Australia that are into Monero. It seems like there's there's a, little, there's a pretty good contingent. Yeah, it's kind of a tough question to answer, I think, because uh, on the one hand, there's some things culturally about Australia that really, really click with Monero. Uh, Australians are very um, culturally kind of anti-authority, uh, very... You know, against what we call it tall poppy syndrome. Do you guys have that expression? No. So in a, in a field of plants, basically, you don't want to be the one that's taller than all the rest. You get right, chopped you up. Get chopped down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no one wants to be kind of seen as the person who's putting himself above everyone else and in that position of authority. That's what we call mm -hmm. tall poppy syndrome. Okay. Uh, so it's there's sort of this anti-authoritarian thing. It's a nation of convicts, right? You know, we're we're all crooks. <laughs> exactly. Or at least you know, this, we sort of have this sense of you know we come from that stock. And, so, uh, so you see digital cash, you're like, hey, wait a minute. We could do things exactly. with this. So I think it, it resonates culturally here, which means people kind of get it pretty intuitively. Yes. Uh, at least the kind of people who are going to get crypto in general get Monero. They, they get the value proposition. They definitely do. But on the other hand, uh, what, what uh, probably a lot of people, especially in the US, would have noticed over the course of COVID is that it's also... Uh, in some ways, a much more authoritarian country than the U.S. Yeah, yeah very, I was very confused by that because I never, I never followed the politics closely in Australia until COVID. And then when that happened, I was like, "Wait, I thought the culture would have been completely opposed to this. Yeah. How is this happening?" But it was just because there's a small fiefdom of people that were in charge. Uh, yeah, 
I think I don't, it's, I don't go all the way down the rabbit hole. Yeah, ex- explain that a little bit to us. Like, how did how did that happen? Given the the nature of the average Australian, I think it's just like the US has New York and it has Florida, and they handled it very differently. So Australia had Melbourne and Sydney, which are kind of two largest cities, and especially Melbourne had really really harsh lockdowns and just you know police violently beating protesters and uh, you know and sometimes like quite unprovoked and there's montages you can find online of serious police brutality problems in Melbourne. Um, meanwhile, if you go north up to where I am up in Queensland, it was much, much less locked down. There were some, you know, there was restrictions for a while. Um, a lot of people basically ignored them up here um, or at least, you know, played very fast and loose with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, so the easiest way to explain is there's basically three big states down the east coast of Australia from north where I am is Queensland, then New South Wales in the middle, then Victoria. And they're the three most populous states. Most of the population is in those three states. Okay. Um, so as you go north to south, it kind of goes more we like freedom down to more we want to be tread on real hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It just kind of goes that way roughly. Um, Hilarious that it's the opposite, right? Of like, Yeah, region. maybe it's to do with the weather or something. <laughs> yeah, the hemisphere. Over there. The in the north here. Hemispheres, yeah. Yeah, and so I think, for instance, the border between Queensland, where I am, and New South Wales, which is where I'm originally from, to the south, that border was closed and there was, you know, big concrete barriers and stuff and no one was meant to be able to cross the border for a while. But, of course, heaps of people did all the time. <laughs> Uh, so there was this kind of this um, um, this mass civil disobedience that went on in Queensland. Uh, I think especially as you get out of the cities, the more rural you go, the more it's really not like what you would have seen from these montages in the city. So I know people in kind of a smaller country town with a lot of farms uh, a few hours away from here where they said, you know, it must have been a year or two into all the lockdown stuff. They'd never seen someone wearing a mask in person, only on TV. That tells you just the further out bush you go, the more yeah. people just completely ignored it. Yeah, yeah but it, it was crazy to see that overall, though, the, the government, you know, d- despite these large areas of rebels, uh, yeah. the government ultimately was able to, you know. Mm. You got away with a lot, more than I would have thought. Yeah, um, crack down on people. Scary. So, yeah. I think I, yeah, the more you the more you get out of the country, the more you'll find crypto people, Monero people. Um, the more you're hanging out with kind of you know suit wearing pointy shoot inner city types, the less of that you'll probably see. So are there are there any like Monero meetups that are taking taking place? Are there um, I'm not there? aware of any specific Monero meetups. Uh, I'm involved in like an ongoing monthly meetup with a bunch of guys who are kind of very uh, you know, who are libertarian minded, uh, who are, who are Christians, um, which I think, you know, we'll talk about some of that today. And for them, those two things kind of go together. Um, and they talk about a bunch of different things, a bunch of them kind of are so Monero people, uh, but it's not a Monero meetup, but we do talk about that kind of thing. And so we've, you know, we buy and sell with each other with Monero sometimes, but, you know, we talk about investing strategy and, with, you know, some of us are thinking of doing homeschool as our kids start to be school age and we, you know, some of these practical things. What, what, is, what is the uh, the group called? Uh, it, we call it Iron Sharpens Iron. Oh wow, very cool man. Which is a you know a reference to yeah. something in the Bible that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Yeah. So what what is the connection there uh, that that you're that that you see between the Christian faith and uh, you know liberty and in yeah, I guess to to tie it in here to digital cash like what what is the what what is the thinking there uh see i guess that's a big question because obviously there's a lot of christians and probably the majority who would not be strictly you know what you call libertarians um, mm-hmm. and so there's gee there's an awful lot more yeah back, yeah well, let's go down you know we'll, we'll slowly i guess i guess first yeah, first i wrote question. about that question yes. it is roughly 400 pages I ha- I haven't had the chance to read. I know you sent it to me like yesterday, but it was I had a busy, unfortunately, a, a non no related it's busy fair. busy couple of days. Uh, crypto I, too. I especially I found with the section. There's a brief section in it where I talk specifically about uh, kind of about crypto, but I, I 
kind of said Bitcoin because I expected them to be not okay. initiated people who were reading this. But I will be taking a, a deeper look at this book. I'm in, I'm very intrigued by the topic. But give me give me a rundown. What what is the basic thesis that you lay out? Yeah. So um, to kind of give a short bit of context, so it kind of makes sense um, for my. Bible college degree. So I went and did theological study, what you would do if you were going to be the pastor of a church. You do some academic study and you learn Greek and Hebrew and learn church history and all these kind of things. So I did did that as if I was going to be a church pastor, though I never really was going to do that. Just wanted to do the study and know all that stuff. Uh, and towards the end of that, I was a master's degree. So I had to write a big, long kind of thesis piece. Uh, and so at the time, I was briefly considering whether I might become a politician whether I'd actually run for office and try to again, make a difference that way. And so I decided I'm going to write a thesis kind of in that space. I thought I want to write it on the subject of taxes because I thought if I can answer that question, so the question would be if I'm going to be a politician and someone asks me a question about tax policy, you know, should we raise the taxes by 10% here or lower than 10% there or have sales tax instead of income tax or these kind of things. I thought if I could answer that question, because it's so fine-tuned, because it could be, you know, is it 11%, is it 12%? Mm -hmm. If I had a good framework biblically to talk about that, I could probably apply that framework to lots of other issues. That's fine. So I'll write a thesis about, you know, what's a biblical framework for how a politician should think about levying taxes. Yes. And so I, I, I went, uh, I'm, I'm smiling because I, I went through that same process when I ran for Congress. And not so yeah. much, uh, you know, I, I was looking for principles you know I, I have my principles but i was looking to, to f formulate them in a way where i could apply that algorithm to any issue right exactly so trying to get the first principles stick, stick to my first principles. principles yes and for, and for yeah. me obviously it's liberty right which is a very general concept but yeah. um yeah in my mind i i felt like i was able to view each different issue through that yeah. same algorithm that i created in my mind to kind of arrive at where i am on the issue so Exactly. Uh, very very so, cool. So yeah, go ahead. Continue. I proposed the thesis to write. It was based around a guy named Abraham Kuyper, which I don't know if anyone out there is familiar with. It's kind of obscure. He was the prime minister of the Netherlands in, okay. I forget what year. I don't remember. Yeah. Never. Yeah. I, I don't know. The early name. 1900s, late 1800s. I should remember that. But yeah, pre-World Wars. Um, mm -hmm. So he was the prime minister of the Netherlands. And also he was a theologian. So he had done all the study and written all this stuff about this. And I thought, this guy has thought it through. I can learn some things from this guy. So I proposed to write a thesis around his thought about taxes. And then I started doing all the reading and realized I thought he was totally wrong, uh, which was kind of a shock because I expected him to pretty much have it straight. And as I went deeper and deeper and deeper and started reading, kind of I, I went back and read everything I could find in the Bible about it, obviously, but I've read early church fathers. I read some like medieval scholars. I read the reformers from kind of the 15th, 1600s. And by the time I kind of got deep into it, I went, I've had this all wrong. Most people I know have had this all wrong for so long. The short answer is that the, the biblical framework all the way through is that taxation is a form of slavery. That's, that's how the Bible looks at it consistently. And even that language is used where they talk about taxes. And so naturally the title of the book I eventually wrote is Taxation is Slavery. Uh, there's a chapter early on in that where I kind of address the elephant in the room and talk about, I think particularly for my American friends and readers for whom I think the issue of slavery is a very emotive one because uh, there's, yes, it's in the history, but I think it's so much in the consciousness mm -hmm. of the Americans I know that, you know, slavery is in the past of the US and it still, like, it still forms part of the political discourse today. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to be careful of saying, look, it's not that people, people are literally in chains with whips on their backs and this sort of thing. But if you read the Bible, if you go through looking at all the places where it talks about kings levying taxes, everywhere that happens, they use the language of slavery and freedom to talk about it. That's how they describe it. You do want you do want to belittle belittle the term, but the fact mm -hmm. is yeah, that I is agree with you. It, 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 it is it is ultimately slavery, right? The fiat the fiat system. Yeah, uh, is is a form of slavery where where people are ultimately controlled by the exactly. state, and you know, wealth or value is is weaned off of them at, at that at their will for their yeah. own personal gain. And so, I think probably 
some people will have heard of uh, Augustine, who was one of kind of the early church fathers. And mm. I found this great passage in Augustine where he's talking about um, someone who gets brought in before Alexander the Great to be, you know, who's a, a robber, basically, who gets brought in before Alexander to be judged and punished. And the robber says, like, looks at Alexander and says, I'm doing exactly what you do. You just do it on a larger scale. And Augustine kind of commentates on that and says, you know, what are kingdoms? They are just great robberies. And, uh, so, but just to, to take a step back, I mean, and I guess maybe you kind of touched upon this, but uh, at first glance, some may take the opposite, uh, uh, interpret make the opposite interpretation of the Bible, right? It was those oh, yeah. that, that, that don't really look into it at all, but just, you know, with some of the, the broad statements that have been made, right? I think one of the, what's the, one of the most popular quotes, it's like, um, go ahead. Yeah. So there's yeah. basically two, two passages. Yeah. So if you go into, if you pick a church down the street and go in and ask someone, what do yeah. they think about taxes in the Bible? They'll probably tell you one of two passages. Yeah. Um, one is Romans 13. Uh, that's probably the bigger of the two. Uh, that's the Apostle Paul writing to the Christians in Rome. And he says, basically, um, the the powers that be are servants of God and make sure, so pay taxes because they attend to important work, which is that they bear the sword and they punish evildoers and you know, give taxes where taxes are due and honor where honor is due and so on. And so I, I just like do a lot of work on that passage in the book, but the gist of it basically is you need to read that in the context of the whole Bible and everything else said about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think where most Christians read that and go, see, it says pay taxes where taxes are due. And that's the end of the argument for most Christians. I think, uh, I think it needs to be read in the context of, you know, God authorizes tax revolts multiple times in the Bible. And so that's not consistent unless I think we read Paul as saying, it sucks that you guys in Rome are stuck under Caesar's rule. But the strategy I recommend for you is essentially a kind of what I call tactical pacifism. So love your enemies, do good to those who hate you and hurt you, you know, pay the taxes, be model citizens. This is how you'll kind of get through to them rather than trying to get into open bloody warfare. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is very, yeah, that's a hugely Christian theme, right? Uh, love yeah. your enemies. Yes. Kill, kill them with kindness exactly and so exactly. that that was really so it wasn't it was it's not that their you know ta taxes are 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 righteous it's this yeah. this is the right thing for you to do to yeah. this is the right strategy for you right it's not that caesar is righteous to impose it on you right and the other one is matthew 22 which that's the part in the book when i looked at matthew 22 is when i had a section talking about bitcoin and crypto um, so we can talk about that if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so Matthew 22 is where some people come to Jesus and they're trying to trap him. And so two groups that really do not get along decided to team up to try and sort of get Jesus in, into a pickle. They're gonna, you know, they're going to own him. It's, you know, it's a question. So they come to him and they say, uh, teacher, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And uh, the the issue there is that basically they're trying to put him in this place where if he says, yes, pay the taxes. He looks like a traitor to the Jewish people because obviously he's Jewish and, you know, the Romans are invading them, oppressing them. And he looks like he's, you know, pro-Rome and that's, you know, that's terrible. So you can imagine if, you know, if China invaded the US and someone said, yes, we should pay our taxes to the Chinese government and they, you know, they would get blasted as a traitor. That's mm -hmm. kind of one option. The other one is that he says, no, 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 don't pay the taxes to Rome. And then they can throw him under the bus as, hey, you're, seditious they can dub him into the romans as a you know revolutionary so it's kind of rock in a hard place and what he says is bring me a denarius which is this roman coin the picture of caesar on it and so they bring in the coin and he says whose picture is this whose inscription and they say it's caesar's and he says give to caesar what is caesar and to god what is god's and that's kind of his sort of wise answer to a difficult question and so there's then a bunch of debate over exactly what does he mean by that. Uh, most Christians kind of have, like with Romans 13, have kind of taken it at face value and said, okay, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That means pay your taxes. Right. And I think it's a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. What is what is your interpretation of that? What is it? Uh, so, yeah, my interpretation of that basically is 
just to make sure to first go back and look at what question he's answering. They don't come to him and say, is it required mm -hmm. to pay taxes to Caesar? What they say is, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? They're asking, are we allowed to pay? It, for, for us as, you know, Torah observant Jews who, you know, follow the Old Testament teaching, is it permissible for us to pay? So there was even this debate in Jesus' day about, is it even okay to touch a Roman coin? Because it's got Caesar's picture engraved on it, is that a graven image? So people will remember from the Ten Commandments, there's a commandment in there, don't make any graven images, don't like carve an idol. And people did worship Caesar as God in some sense. So there was this question of, is it even okay to touch that? Or is it like a pagan idol, that picture of Caesar? And so Jews tended to prefer to have these Jewish coins that still circulated rather than and try to avoid touching Roman coins, at least, you know, pious Jews, dedicated Jews. And so Jesus obviously touches one. He doesn't particularly have a problem with it. Uh, but I think what he's saying is, look, it's okay to be ripped off. It's not a sin for you to be stolen from. So don't worry about that. It is okay to pay, but don't let it become... To, to the point where your devotion is to Caesar rather than to God. Uh, it's, it's not a sin to pay. It's not a sin to go along with being stolen from, to kind of take this pacifist route, uh, but make sure your devotion stays to God, not to Caesar. Hmm. What was the exact line? It was give... Can, can you repeat Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Hmm. What, so what you naturally raise the question, what is Caesar's? Yeah, yes, and, and what is God's, right? What, yeah. So is is it a belittling of of not a belittling of what is you know but what of what is Caesar's it's it's not that important there's more yeah there's more there's much more important things like give to Caesar what is Caesar's it's just these it's material items yeah basically and I think people have drawn I think a correct parallel saying look Caesar's inscription is on the coin but God's inscription is on you so that's a biblical idea from Genesis that we as human beings are made in the image of God. And so this is an image of Caesar and you're in the image of God. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, just a coin, but give yourself your devotion to God. Hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, I think kind of what he's getting at there. But to bring it back to something I think the crypto audience will find interesting, this this raises a tricky point for a lot of a lot of Christians, I think, because I will hear and I have heard pastors argue in their preaching on this passage, the reason that you can and should and you know, are required to pay taxes to the government is because their inscription is on the money. It's their their money in a sense. Mm -hmm. So right, that uh, I think the lines I quoted, a particular guy who said, um, that which has Washington's picture on it can be mailed back to Washington. And um, that which has Federal Reserve note written on it can be sent back to the Federal Reserve. And uh, you know, in our country, uh, until recently, because she died, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth, her picture was on all of our coins and so you could say, you know, it's Queen Elizabeth's coin, so it can be sent to Queen Elizabeth. I think Canadians are the same, I'm pretty sure. Uh, my problem with that is that now just supposing that people en masse started adopting crypto in daily transactions and a bunch of people even started living full time on crypto. There was enough of a circular economy in their area that they could do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that these pastors who preach on this passage would tell those people, you don't have to pay taxes because there's no picture of the president or the queen or anyone on your money, so you're exempt. I don't think they'd say that at all, and I certainly don't think the government would say that. They'd say, uh, pay, pay Satoshi. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Now, now with uh, inscriptions, inscriptions on Monero, I don't know. If, if, my, if my face yeah. is on there, they might say, pay, pay Tumen. <laughs> there's a more than you have to give that one back to him yeah the thing is i don't think it ever enters you know the people who are saying we want to levy a tax i don't think it ever enters their minds that because you know queen elizabeth is on the coins that's what you know if you want to use those coins then you have to abide by queen elizabeth's right. taxes i don't think it ever enters their mind really it just it's a matter of you have stuff we want that stuff we have guns. You don't. You have to give us some of your stuff to spend on what we want to do. Right. And, and I don't think it's any more complicated than that. 
do you have any insight into i mean this is very, very difficult but I, I imagine the interpretation of of those you know black letter lines right that appear to say pay your taxes mm -hmm. i imagine when those were interpreted it throughout history they were done by those that wanted people to pay taxes right they yeah, were, it wasn't it was you know, those that, that you know that really got the word out on on what these uh, quotes meant were essentially propaganda coming from from the state so my like, god, god is saying you should pay you should pay your taxes look it says it right here definitely um anyone who's read murray rothbard wrote this really short book called anatomy of the state and one of the things he points yeah. out in there is that the state has always had this interesting partnership with uh kind of academics or like a priestly class mm -hmm. in their day who the job of the court academics is to legitimize what the government is trying to do in the mind of the public. Um, so in a bygone era, that was often religious figures and literally priests who would be making the case that uh, God is on the side of the government. And there is still some of that today. Um, I was really shocked, actually, when I went to Hawaii uh, for our honeymoon. We, we decided just to drop in on a church service that was happening just to see what it was like. It was church on the beach in Waikiki. And we went down there and we were shocked at how, uh, I guess, how much like American patriotism was just woven in to it. We're just, we're kind of, well, I th maybe it's partly because it's like a military base right there or something, but there was this really strong sense of we are Americans and it's just as important that we are Americans as that we are Christians. And those two things aren't really separate. They're just, it's all woven together. Where in Australia, like that's really foreign to us culturally. Like the idea of having like a national flag on the church, like that's strange to us. Mm, so yeah. just, just as a cross-cultural tidbit, but well, I mean, that, that kind of shows you, yes, there's always been this sense in which the government wants to have intellectuals making the case that the government is good for you and uh, is you know, has God on their side and all this kind of thing. And so, in the modern world, I think that tends to be more kind of uh, an, a scientific establishment has kind of taken that veneer of being the priestly class. So it's like a Fauci mm -hmm. kind of figure who's going to be this intellectual figurehead for why you need to let the government do X, Y, Z thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, in the past, it's often been literally the priests. And so what I found really interesting to watch is that if I, as I went back through church history and read earlier and earlier people talking about these issues, the earlier you go, the the less on board with taxes and stuff that they are. So I talked about Augustine saying, look, kingdoms are just great robberies. Alexander is just a thief. He is just a plunderer and a robber. Um, but that's it. He's, Augustine's writing 400s AD. So that's after Constantine, uh, which just, just to catch the listeners up on a quick bit of Christian history. So Jesus rises from the dead. The church launches, the apostles launch the church and for a few hundred years, it is illegal to be a Christian. Basically, the Christians are persecuted, tortured. Nero burns heaps of them at the stake. Uh, it's a huge deal. They, heaps of them get killed for being Christians and for converting away from paganism. Uh, eventually, Constantine is a Roman emperor who comes up and he kind of says, actually, I'm a Christian. I'm going to be a Christian. And there's you know lots of debate to be had over, like, does he really believe you know, in Jesus and that he rose from the dead? No, you know, he's a questionable character think of him like the donald trump of his day right like you sort of uh you're kind of going oh, i don't do i really uh, where are you really at do i really believe you uh, like the morality of some stuff is yeah he's still like he's making war on people and it's pretty sketchy but still because he says that suddenly christianity is legal throughout the roman empire it's legal to be a christian and it's even maybe a social positive because suddenly you could say i'm the same religion as the emperor so there's suddenly this thing where it goes from being it will make you a social outcast and possibly in fear of your life to now it suddenly might be even a social advantage. And there's this huge shift there where if you go back before Constantine and you read like early church father like Irenaeus, and this is all in the book if people are really interested in this stuff, uh, like I've got all the lengthy quotations and things, you know, Irenaeus will say, look, you can't be an emperor and be a Christian. Those two things don't go together. The nature of being an emperor is you go out and you kill people to take their land and enslave them. And that's totally antithetical to what we're about as Christians. You, 
you'd have to be, you'd have to leave Christianity first before you could do those things. So that's 180 AD, roughly, that he's writing that. So, you know, 120 odd years before, well, more 140 maybe before Constantine, before that kind of era. Uh, so if you go really early, they're really clear on this. Christianity is not an empire building religion. Mm -hmm. But then after Constantine, it becomes kind of the official religion of the Roman Empire. You get, you know, Roman Catholicism and there's sort of this intermingling of church and state that kind of comes out of that. And that's kind of stayed with us ever since to the point where when you get up to the Protestant Reformation in kind of the 1500s, and there's going to be this sort of mass sense of some things have crept into the church, which is, you know, there's only one basically at that time. There's, a, there's the Orthodox, which we'll leave aside. Love you, Manero Mateo. We'll <laughs> leave out of the discussion for a second. But there's really only the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe, and it hasn't split yet, but they're saying some things have crept in here. We want to go back to the Bible. Uh, we want to have the Bible critique some of these traditions. It splits in half into Catholics and Protestants. But even the Protestants at that point who are trying to separate out what's tradition from what's biblical, the Protestants there are still very pro the king, pro taxes. Um, John Calvin is a name that you know, people who are theology buffs will have heard of John Calvin. Mm -hmm. And I think he wrote some of just the most terrible stuff on the material that I've seen where he goes, look, it doesn't matter how someone becomes king, even if they become king through just complete violence and bloodshed. Once they're king, God wants them to be king and you must obey them. Like it, it kind of takes that face value reading of Romans 13 that it just takes it to an extreme. And yeah. Probably, so yeah. There you go. I've had my rant. That's kind of big overview of church history on interpreting these passages. So the earlier you go, the clearer they are. Taxes are bad. Taxes are slavery. Um, Tertullian says to, to tax someone is to make them a slave to conquer someone is to put taxes on them. They are one and the same thing all, all the way through to Calvin saying it's good and righteous that the King exists and puts taxes on you and you should obey all the time. It makes sense to me as, you know, an individual. And when I, when I think about the ethics of these things, right. And, mm. um, I, I, I was, I was, I was, I was raised Catholic. Right. And so there, there's something in me that, you know, uh, always, always drives me towards uh, liberty, right? And uh, mm. I and I, I know a great many libertarian able... Catholic. What's that? It has been really interesting to me as I've kind of seen more and more of the libertarian world to see how how many libertarian Catholics I see. Uh, like yeah, I never, I never really thought about people. that. Yeah, I never really. So is that is that a real thing? Is that a, there's a a strong uh, yeah, like I think it is, and I'm not entirely sure why, because to me, I think Catholicism has a pope. It sort of has this authoritarian structure to the church, and yet individual Catholics seem to be like weirdly libertarian-leaning. Uh, I don't, I, I haven't totally worked out what it is about. Kind well, of maybe the, it's um, just the, 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 Christian, the, the Christian aspect of Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it is. Maybe it's not specific to Roman Catholicism. Maybe yeah. it's just broadly Christian worldview. Yeah, well, I, th I think it is. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. So, so when you say when you when you go back further and further, um, the, the the basic ideals are are anti antithetical to, to you know to certainly to things like monarchs. So, what what is you know what ultimately would you say is the the Christian ideal Christian form of government? Would it be like something like an, like agorism or what, 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 you know, yeah, this so, is a difficult question. Um, but... I'm very sympathetic to the agorist view, uh, kind of, you know, Sal Mayweather was on recently and I would say I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of 90% with Sal. <laughs> There's some stuff that I have questions about, but I'm like, I'm very sympathetic to the agorist. 
Um, I'm actually wearing a T-shirt that I tend to wear because so here on elections are compulsory here. You have to vote. You get fined if you don't vote. It's not optional. And so you have to go to the voting booth and tick your name off to not have to pay the fine. And so I wear this shirt when I go to the voting booth now that says no king but Christ. <laughs> and so that is that is broadly what I think is a, a correct reading of scripture on this issue that we should we should privatize everything. The only person who's fit to rule us is Jesus. He's the one fit to be king. And there's this whole arc through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation where you can see that. So uh, just to back up, there was a time, I'm trying to think where to start. One of the questions I wanted to answer in the master's thesis was, where did taxes come from? Where did the first ones happen? I thought, well, I've got the Bible. It goes kind of pretty much all the way back in human history. I should see some indication in there. So I did the reading and basically went, hey, there was a time when it was normal for people to live with no king. There was this big anarchic period and it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't all roses. So people who have read any of the book of Judges will know that there's some horrific stuff in there, but it's not markedly worse either. Uh, and so there's this period with ancient Israel where they live in, you know, they've come out of Egypt, they live in the promised land, they're no longer slaves to Pharaoh and they have no king for centuries. And then eventually they decide under the prophets, they, they have a prophet Samuel who they tell, hey, we want a king, just like all the other nations around us. And God through Samuel says, no, 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 you don't want a king. It's a terrible idea. He, he will charge you. He will take 10% of all your stuff and make you, quote, slaves. And Samuel tells this to the people and they go, no, 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 we still want a king. Uh, there's a lot more to that story. Again, talk about all of that at length in the book. But I look back at that and go, I think it's worth taking God there at face value when he says, you don't want a human king. It's a bad idea. I know things aren't great now, but they won't be better with a human king. You want God as your king, basically. And so the big arc of the Bible is, will God's people come back to a place where they have God as their king again? And so like the big character in the book of Ruth in the time of Judges, his name is Elimelech, meaning God is king. That was what characterized the period of the Judges before there was Saul and David and Solomon and Israel had this period of kings. And then eventually the idea is Jesus comes. He is from the line of David. He has like a human lineage to be able to rule Israel, but he's also God. He's God the Son come in human form to be king. Sudden, like this is what's going to unify it all together. God will be king again, and that will be what kind of fixes everything. Uh, so that's one big story arc of the Bible. When will God be king again? When Jesus comes and Jesus reigns. And so that's hence no king but Christ. I don't think we need any human rulers at all. I think we can just do without that. So I, I accept the term anarchist or agorist pretty freely. I've got some footnotes there about you know, I think Jesus should be king and he's, he's human. He's also God, but he's human. You know, there's eh, technicalities. But for this stage of history where Jesus is not visibly with us reigning, no, I don't think we need any other human rulers. I think we can privatize everything. Rothbardian anarchist. Rules and no rulers. Exactly. What do you, any, any thought to, to what the rules need to be? Have you, have you laid yeah, that out um, in your mind? So uh, anyone who's read a bunch of Rothbard, as that was a big influence on me when I was figuring all this stuff out, uh, will know the Rothbardian view is all to do with natural law. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that is kind of a big thing there. There is a natural law woven into the created world already. And, you know, it's what we want to do is come up with practical approximations to natural law rather than try to invent laws for ourselves to try and get certain outcomes. So a uh, big principle of kind of libertarian legal theory that I think is a good one is what's called homesteading. So if you go out and find a natural resource untouched, no one's done anything with it ever before, if you're the first one to cultivate it and kind of make something out of it, it's yours. That's your private property. It doesn't belong to anyone else. That's how we decide who owns what. The first person to homestead it, has the property rights to it, and then they can sell it, trade it, gift it, whatever. Once you have that one principle, now there's borders, boundaries, private properties. This bit of land is mine. 
I tilled the land. I planted the crops. Proof of work. Proof of work. You put energy exactly. into it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so once you have those boundaries, a, a lot of legal issues just automatically solved. So even things like you know, free speech issues, uh, can you say this? Can you not say that? Well, you're on my property. Uh, I like what you're saying. I'm happy to hear you. Fire away. Or you're on my property. I think what you're saying is obscene. I'm, you know, I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm going to ask you to leave. It's, you know, there doesn't have to be one rule for everywhere. Mm -hmm. People say, hey, in in this venue, which I am the owner of, these are the rules. And if you want to live under different rules, you want to operate on different rules, find someone who agrees with you and do it in their space. Uh, I think that that kind of solves a huge swathe of the usual legal difficulties. Mm -hmm. yeah. People people are free to associate among each other, create exactly. rules. And free to them. disassociate, importantly. Um, Right, and create rules among their own groups as long as there's some 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 a basic rule base based on on natural on natural law, yeah. Primarily so, the right to to your own property, exactly. Uh, property rights kind of resolve yeah, and to own what you produce. Yeah, uh, my go-to guy on this stuff is a guy named Bob Murphy. A lot of you all have heard of him. Uh, so he's he's also a Christian, also like a voluntarist kind of anarchist thinker. Uh, he wrote a book called Chaos Theory. Uh, which is kind of about this sort of stuff. How would we do law and order and uh, how would we do like military defense and all these kind of things in a society with no central government? Um, so Chaos Theory is a short book. I think it's available for free on Mises.org. Um, but yeah, great read if people are going like, how could you possibly have a court system without a central government? Things like that. Great little read to answer a lot of those questions. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, I love that resource. Uh, the Mises. There, there's tons of tons of great like PDFs on there and stuff, right? Like things that you can just grab. Um, what? So, uh, so where? Go ahead. You were gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, there's stuff I found on the Mises website. In particular, an essay called "The Law" by Frederick Bastiat. That mm -hmm. was reading Bastiat was kind of the tipping point for me when just everything else kind of cascaded out after I read that one essay. So that's a great read also. Uh, and yeah. it's Catholic. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a died in the world Protestant who was writing my thesis at a Protestant college. And I had to say the guy who completely resolved most of my difficulties was this French Catholic guy. <laughs> yes. I read that as well. What would, what's your, what's your summary of that for those, for those listening? Yeah. Summary of Bastias the law. Uh, he basically says, uh, look, anything that you would not be allowed to do as an individual, the government should not be allowed to do as a group. Uh, the only laws that are legitimate are laws that would apply equally to you as an individual as to any group of people. You know, getting together as a group doesn't change any of the rules. So if I couldn't take money out of your wallet, no group of people has the right to do that. Right. You, you don't know really all of a sudden have a, a monopoly on violence just because you've created a group of people. Yeah, exactly. And he kind of fleshes that out with a bunch of concrete examples, but that's his basic thesis. Where, so where in the, you know, are, are there examples in the Bible that, you know, speak to, you know, we, we talked about a little bit, but just speak to this idea of perhaps agorism being what, you know, Christians would see as the ideal form of, of government yeah uh like agorism specifically when i think of agorism I I specifically of counter economic so doing illegal things <laughs> for you know for the benefit of people and and for profit at the same time um anarchism yeah like there are certainly yeah i mean in the time of the judges uh one of the people that we introduced to is gideon uh, so at the time israel gets conquered by another people group called the midianites and God raises up Gideon to kind of lead Israel to revolt against Midianite rule and kick them out. So the Midianites have, you know, because they've conquered Israel, they're imposing a tax on Israel and they're sick of that. So Gideon kind of leads them in battle and kicks them out. We're not going to pay your taxes anymore, Midianites. When we meet Gideon, he is in the process of an overt act of tax evasion. So he's got the wheat that he's meant to give a cut of to the Midianites and he's threshing the wheat inside a wine press to hide it. So he's effectively, you know, keeping his crop hidden from the tax man. Mm -hmm. um, so that happens in the Bible and that's, you know, it's a positive thing. 
uh, trying to think of other really clear examples. Like there are certainly people doing civil disobedience. Um, it's hard to say a line where that becomes agorism because uh, that's really what you're looking for people like trading on the black market and that sort of thing, which it's hard to have a black market without a lot of sales tax and that sort of thing. It's just the market. Yeah, well, I guess that's ultimately the, what I'm getting at, right? So g given this this framework that you've, you know, uh, arrived at based on your your study of, you know, Christianity and other other philosophies and things you've read, um, how how do you view things like obviously pure open markets we, we spoke about, but something like digital digital cash, untraceable digital cash, right? Because mm -hmm. it's something we talk about obviously on the show all the time, but yeah. the the ethical arguments for why it, yeah. you know society should adopt a utility like this. Where obviously there's there's you know uh, b bad that can come along with it, right? There's there's evil that can be done using this tool. But ultimately, why? Wh what is the argument to be made as to why it's ethically the the right thing to do to adopt something yeah. like like a Monero? Sure. Uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is uh, I'm a software engineer in my kind of day job life and I build tools and all tools could be used for bad things. And that's just how building tools is. And as soon as you realize that, you know, that should never stop us from building tools because we wouldn't have the modern world. There's, there's so much more good than there is bad that come, even though people use everything for something bad. People are sinners, people are wicked. They find evil uses for everything. Doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. Uh, so that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is, I think once you kind of reach the point of going counter economics is ethical. So doing things that are moral, but illegal, in order to undermine the authority of the state. Once you get your head around that, then private untraceable digital cash is just an obvious means to that end. So the example I like to give is people smuggling food into Venezuela. Uh, so in Venezuela, people have heard, you know, the, I forget what the numbers are, but the average person had dropped some huge amount of weight. It was, you know, over 10 kilos, close to 20 kilos, I think, of weight that people were losing from just there not being food available. And, you know, that's due to bad government policy and, you know, stopping people from doing trade and importing and exporting and messing with the currency and in hyperinflating. And I think the right answer to that, the right strategy to deal with that is the agorist strategy. Have black markets, do lots of smuggling, go and do free trade and do work for people outside the country and import food in and do all of that, even though it's illegal, because there's nothing immoral about it. There's nothing immoral about doing work for someone, getting paid, spending it on food, distributing food. Those are all good things. No one should be allowed to tell you not to do them. And the, the most effective way to get those bad laws changed is to mass disobey them. Uh, so once you have your head around, the way the Lord really changes is people just stop obeying it. Mm -hmm. That's that's what works. Then digital cash is just a means to an end um, in terms of finding liberty. And so some other examples, I think, uh, so the legalization of marijuana in the US, that's, I think, a really clear example of people just did it anyway. It was illegal but people still grew it and sold it and smoked it. They just ignored the law and did it anyway. And the end result is that now it's getting gradually legalized everywhere. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of uh, kind of recreational drug use, but the principle there I think is an important one to notice. Uh, one from my country, I remember before I had all these epiphanies as a younger man, I, was, I read Romans 13 very much as this, you should always obey the law of the land to the letter. Um, and so I was very concerned about uh, wanting to make sure I wasn't ever coming anywhere close to infringing on any copyright rules on anything, uh, just as in I did digital stuff for a living. And one of the things that everyone did was taping stuff on a, you know, people had VHS tapes in a VCR and they would tape stuff off TV and people would have in their cupboard, you know, 50 movies that they'd taped off TV on VHS tapes that they had rather than buying them. And that was illegal. And I sort of thought, well, that's wrong. We shouldn't do that because it's against the law. And then at some point it just got legalized. 
So when I was about 12, it just, they just changed it. They mm -hmm. said, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's now totally legitimate. And I kind of had this epiphany. went, well, hold on. Only last week you were saying this is immoral and no one should do it, and now it's totally fine. Like, obviously, this is arbitrary. You're just making it up as you go. I realized like, that is the case. They were just making it up. And so as soon as people just ignored it, they changed it. It wasn't some principle they were trying to hold everyone to. It's just this was convenient then, and now people are ignoring us. That undermines our power. We can't have that. We have to look like we're in charge and in control. So we're changing the law to conform with common practice. Um, and so yeah, I mean, more people say we won't tolerate uh, being told we can't trade with each other the more it will just become legal. I say, yeah, I voice it all the time on, on this show, right? The only thing that can stop Monero is people... False belief, belief that it can be false belief that it can be stopped, right? And if, yeah. if everybody decides tomorrow that we're going to use this protocol for transacting, it yeah. exists and it won't stop. And just this week, people have started talking all the more about Fed now, instant yes. Fed accounts. And so like, it might come upon us sooner than we think that we've got to really try and make it happen. Have you been following in Australia the CBDCs? Uh, somewhat, um, because you know I have I've been in the crypto space for a while, and I have I have a bunch of crypto, I have a bunch of silver coins. Like you know, the place I where just, I live I just now, feel like Australia would be on the cutting edge of trying to yeah. implement the CBDC, right? Our central bank is working on a CBDC as well, but I live sort of out of the city in a place where everyone has a garden. Everyone's growing at least some of their own food. There are like organic farmers markets all the time. We'll probably be more or less okay out here. Like it won't be good if food production dramatically decreases, but I feel better off here than I would be in a lot of other places. Uh, we have some food here, which like I will be able to buy one way or another. So we're in, we're in kind of a good spot. People are very open to I guess it technically is a black market, but it's you know, it's a farmer's market. Is that a black market? Depends who you ask. But yeah, I mean, some, people some who way. are trading here and just, right. they wouldn't even realize that they're meant to write down and give people tax invoices for the veggies that they sold them. Right. And, and I don't think your average person, if shown that, wouldn't think it's evil. They think, oh, this is a beautiful thing. People coming yeah, together. just growing food and swapping with each other. And, <laughs> right. and then but, literally what they do. When it's, on the internet, when it's on the internet and there's other things mixed in there that they perhaps don't agree with, all of a sudden the, the concept of a marketplace becomes evil. It's so I think if, CBDCs, if a CBDC dystopia breaks out in Australia, it'll be in the city uh, mm -hmm. and the country towns will, like with COVID, they will largely ignore it and go about their business. Do you think it will be a, you know, as predicted by some, that it will be a catalyst for true crypto? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm curious to see. I definitely think it will be for some people. I think if it, we snapped our fingers and it, you know, tomorrow we had to kind of operate on the CBDC and the regular banking system was gone, I think at this point people would still go to like fiat cash. That's just what they're most familiar with. That would be the most natural choice. But definitely some would do crypto. And I think a surprising number of people around here have silver coins. Um, there's a bunch of gold bugs around and this sort of thing. So there'd be a mix of things, I think, until people kind of settled on what was most common and most convenient. And I actually think that would most likely be crypto. Um, so when I've, I've offered people to buy copies of my books and different things like this for, for crypto, for silver, and they choose crypto over metals basically every time because it's more convenient. Slightly different topic, but obviously related And because you, you just got me thinking here as, as, as we're talking about these things. So, you know, there's, there's obviously a strong kind of religious component to crypto itself. <laughs> do you have any thoughts there, opinions there? I mean, as you, you, you study uh, theology, uh, there's, uh, you know, yeah. tribalism, but... In some yeah. ways, it's becoming religious, right? In in way, and you know, some right with Satoshi, and you know, depending how people view things. But there's there's a strong passion for these yeah. concepts, and it kind of a while back, 
Talk. I wrote this satire piece about uh, kind of splits into tribes within crypto and kind yes. of made this analogy between like splitting Christian denominations that uh, like particularly with uh, BTC and BCH that it was like this, it was like the Protestant Reformation of Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. What, this what, huge what you infighting reading? and this splinter group and, you know, no, we're doing what really was in the white paper and no, we're the original. And, uh, exactly. And have a lot of infighting, but I think at the end of the day, when people who are just totally anti-crypto come in, they will kind of have each other's backs to some degree. Uh, like, I forget who said the line, but someone speaking as a Catholic, speaking about Protestants, said, they might be heretics, but they're our heretics. <laughs> Do you see uh, Bitcoiners and Monero people basically having, you know, having the same ethics fund like ultimately? Like, is 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 it is it different on a philosophical level? Do you think between the people that are out that there an, rooting for Monero versus rooting for Bitcoin? That is an interesting question. I think I actually see more diversity of political opinion uh, and kind of and the underlying ideology that leads to those political opinions. I see more diversity, I think, in Monero. Mm -hmm. um, like I follow uh, you know, a bunch of different Monero people on Twitter and I, like I won't name names or anything, but like I see stuff come out of a lot of these very pro-Monero accounts. So they go, that's like, to me, that's kind of further left than I would expect out of a lot of crypto people. Yeah, yeah. Um, where I think, like I was really in the BCH community before I was in, as much into Monero. And I think that's much more ideological like that they are like Mises libertarians in there mm -hmm. um and they kind of they know it uh, they're very they're much more self-aware that their interest in crypto is driven by this underlying uh, kind of libertarian ideology where i think monero people are much more practical some of them are into the, the technology and the use case first and ideology is maybe something they explore later yeah, I agree. I think I think the ideology around Monero is that it's a tool for digital yeah. cash purposes. And I think that's I think that's a good thing. Uh, it goes back to like when when open source software was first being a thing, and uh, so Bruce Perrins wrote this. Uh, I can't think what the document was. Like it might be the, the open source definition or like these standards. These are the things you have to have to be considered an open source license. And one of them was you can't discriminate on users of the software. And the example he would give was you can't stop uh, an abortion clinic or a pro-life activist from using the software. They both have to be allowed to use it or it's not really open source. So whatever your views on that are, you can't license your software in a way that only abortion clinics can use it. Pro-life activists are not allowed or vice versa. You can write a contract like that, but if you do that, it's no longer open source software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think Monero is kind of like that. It's a tool for everyone. The users of Monero are not going to agree on everything, and that's okay. Yeah, I think Monero has done a really good job cult like culturally maintaining that uh, that, yeah. that open openness and everybody agreeing. We're just working on a tool here, and we all agree that we wanted to do this thing. What yeah. people use it for? That's open to you know whether you agree with how they're using it. You can think what you want. Um, I, ha I just had a, a kind of a good question that popped in my oh yeah so a hot topic uh, I don't know if you've been following it and I think it kind of relates to what we we're just talking about so that the ordinals have you been have yeah. you, you touched upon it a little bit the M ordinals right so somebody recently figured out how to basically do um, NFTs on Monero right uh, yeah. it's has, we're we're gonna flush it out tomorrow on our show Monero Topia. I'll be curious but, to hear that, but uh, yeah, to I, that I, end, I yeah, I'm curious. You know, we have we have you here. What your opinion is, especially in light of what we just said, right? Like, I feel like in Monero, everybody, ninety eight percent of the community agrees this thing needs to be digital cash first, yeah. right? Exactly. And, 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 and yeah, fungibility is the key quality. Code. We need to keep that in consideration. Curious yeah. what your what your take is on. So for a project whose kind of fundamental tenet is fungibility and non-fungible token seems like a really strange fit. Uh, so I have some general thoughts on it. I, I'll just have the caveat that I haven't looked too carefully at is there like a particular technical change that made this available? 
or is no, it just, it, it just took advantage, it just took advantage of, of the tech it took advantage of the transaction yeah. extra feel the yeah, if they're just stuffing data into tx extra that's nothing particularly new i just i'd suddenly seen people talking about modernals and is that did something change or is it just the same tx extra data that we had before and i think it's just tx extra yeah uh my basic thinking is um yeah the goal of Monero is to be digital cash i don't think it need i don't think it needs tx extra um there's there's times when you want to be able to link a transaction to metadata out in the world but there's ways to do that without it being on chain uh, so for instance if i send you a monero transaction i can then send you a, a message that you know through some other channel just via email or text message or just to your website whatever encrypted and signed by me so signed using the same key that signed the transaction so you know it's from me it says this transaction is to pay for invoice number 3752. Uh, so being able to link metadata to a transaction is useful, but I don't think it needs to be on chain. We don't need a TX extra field. Um, I'd be okay with it being taken away and they're just not being TX extra Monero anymore. Having said that, uh, you know, life finds a way, I think from Jurassic Park, steganography finds a way. Embedding messages can always be done. Um, right, and that, that's, that's what's being discussed, right? So this idea, if, if not TX extra, it's going to move to some other part of the aspect of Monero. Yeah, uh, so even if it's just to do it with the brute force generating new addresses until you get the characters that you want on the last three digits, and these ten transactions, the last three digits, if you have them all, that's now thirty bytes, and you can put a message in those. Mm -hmm. you can always do it, and this is because I, I did some work kind of in the, the nano ecosystem. This is a big thing there. People kept trying to, there, there's no TX extra. There's nothing like that in nano. They're like Monero. They're very focused on this is transactional. This is cash. Um, they have that similar kind of ethos. So no messages attached to the transaction. And so people would embed messages in the, the long tail of digits mm -hmm. because you can send someone, you know, one nano is roughly $1 it's in that order. But there's like 30 decimal places that you can send. So that 30th decimal place is totally meaningless in value. It's the dust of the dust. Mm -hmm. So they use those digits to send messages. <laughs> so you can't stop yeah, people it. People always find it. Well, well, that's the argument for why we may want to keep TX extra. So at least the, at least it's out in the open. playing takes place in this in the safe area where it may create more damage to privacy if people start do, trying to do it elsewhere. Exactly. Um, and then so one of the thoughts is, I guess, limiting the size and encrypting it in a way where at least every TX extra will, will look the same. Yeah. Yeah, if you could find some kind of encryption scheme that makes... You know, so every TX extra field or every transaction has TX extra and they're always the same length or something right. like that. So there's right. no metadata to be gathered off them or something like that. Um, I think it's a good idea to make it inconvenient to abuse TX extra. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you can't stop it entirely. So I don't know if it's worth putting too many resources behind, but if there's quick wins for ways we can make it inconvenient to abuse it, that's a good idea. How to get your opinion out? Such a, such a hot topic. Somebody somebody just posted a, a Monero Topia ordinal or inscription. I guess it is <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah, trolling is, I think, the major use case at the moment. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into it more tomorrow on the show. It's definitely definitely a hot topic. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you commenting on it. So I, I think that's going to be anything else you want to throw, throw out there. You feel like we didn't touch upon from, you know, this, this topic of, of, of your book. Um, now's the time. Uh, Is there... No, not really. I think we pretty much covered it. There's so much stuff in the book. Like I said, it's basically the book that I wish had existed before I had to write a master's thesis. So it's, it's solid. There's a lot in there for people who are interested in going deep on that kind of stuff. Very um, cool. Yeah, there's, yeah, and it ends on a very kind of gospel-centered note. Look, the the answer to all these human problems about the difficulties of politics and how do we solve violence, the answer to all that is Jesus comes back and he he forgives sins and he raises the dead and he judges evil and it's all about him. So if if that's your if that's your bag, if that's your cup of tea, you might really enjoy it. Very cool, man. Are you working on any other? 
any other books? What's the uh, what's the next book? Is there, what what are you working on these days? I guess what, what uh, are, so, what are you focusing? Yeah. On? I think for for the crypto people, uh, another thing I'll point them to that might be useful uh, if you go to digitalcashtools.com, that's where I do kind of crypto projects. One of them is called Monero D Proxy. Uh, okay. That's for just helping you run a Monero node with low downtime. Uh, so every now and then you need to stop the node running so you can upgrade it to the latest version. And if you run Monero D proxy, you can do that with no downtime for your wallets. Uh, Very cool. So that's a useful thing if you're running like an e-commerce store or stuff like that. What um, inspired yeah, you to build that? Sorry? What inspired you to build that? You just saw a problem? You, you were personally yeah. facing an issue? Okay. Uh, something like that exists for Nano, for their node. And I kind of went, actually, that'd be really useful for Monero because I was trying to integrate uh, Monero wallet RPC to run an online store. And I had this problem, like what if my node goes down and suddenly I can't accept payments. Mm -hmm. And so the proxy gives me like auto failover to a public node. So I don't get downtime. Just Great. if you're trying to run an online store that accepts Monero, it's a useful thing for you. Um, mm -hmm. Worth checking out. And I just, I wanted the project to learn Go, the programming language. So that's what I did. Um, if you're interested in all the biblical stuff, uh, so digitalcashtools.com for my crypto projects beingbiblical.com for all my Bible stuff. And so there's, yeah, I wrote another book there called Who Chose the Books of the Bible, which is what it sounds like for people who are interested in that kind of question. Um, yeah, I think that's about all. Nick, thank you so much, man. I have, I have a feeling you'll be back You'll be back on the show at some point. I know I know you popped into Monero. Topia, please, please uh, pop in more often. I know it's difficult with the timing, right? Because we do it at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern or actually. What yeah, so I do, I do podcasts with people in the U.S. sort of on the semi-regular. It's usually at 2 a.m. for me. So it's been really nice to do one in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. So uh, th this concludes the interview portion. We can move over into the spaces and see if anybody wants to ask you some direct questions. So we'll go ahead and do that now, everybody. Hey, everybody in the Twitter space. Hey, Nick. Yep, we got you. We have people requesting, I believe. Let's see. Anybody else that wants to chat, now's the time to request... You want to ask Nick a question? P3, what's going on? Yo, what's up? Hey, hey how's it going? Inter interesting conversation. I was definitely uh, uh, here with uh, the Monero. It's, it's very fascinating, man. It's, it was a good, a good, good talk, man. Thank you. Cool, man. Do you, ha do you have any questions for Nick? Anything so, that popped into your mind? So, what are, listening? what are the questions that I've been posting on the comment? Jesus did have uh, a question basically from like an ancient IRS agent, right? Which it would, what is referred to as a tax collector. <laughs> yeah, so he had a few interactions with tax collectors. One of his right. disciples was actually a tax collector. Right, Matthew, right? And so in, in Luke 3, 12 to 13, right, we have this ancient IRS collector, right? And, and he tells yep. him, teacher, what shall we do? Yep. And he says, and Jesus says, collect no more than you are authorized to do so, right? Yep. And then, and then we go there. The same context. We go to Romans thirteen, and you have Paul, who is saying that when you submit to the authorities, right, that God has established, and this is in the context of Caesar, right? Um, yeah. At the time that that Paul was, he says, "For this reason, you also pay taxes, for the yes. authorities are God's servants devoted to govern you, right? Pay everyone what is owed, taxes whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, and respect to whom respect is due." So I heard you say that the taxes are are not biblical. Like, how, how do you square that with Levitical law that made Israel pay, like, three tithes, mandatory yeah. taxes? Yeah. And, and then question. with these passages of Jesus, how, how do you square that? Yeah, so uh, I'll hit the Jesus one first. I think that's the easier one. Uh, so a tax collector comes to Jesus and you know, says, what shall we do? Uh, there is a section in the book about it's not just the tax collector there. The, the crowds come to him and ask their question. Tax collector comes and then a Roman soldier comes and he has answers for them one after the other that I think are all related. And so the tax collector's question is, you know, what shall I do? He tells him, don't take any more than you're authorized. Uh, I think that's kind of answering the question of, is it okay for a Christian to take a, a job working for the government? If, if taxation is you know, theft and slavery, like I'm arguing, is it okay, for instance, for, you know, Doug to work for the municipal government? And I would say yes. And I think Jesus is telling the tax collector there, 
it's okay to work for the Roman government. Uh, you're still under the, like You're not the one enslaving us. It's them that's enslaving us. No, but the, so question the, is not about, the question is not about a job. It's about, should I take, Jesus says, you should not take more than what is authorized. Right? It's about yeah, taking so, money, right? Yeah. So I think the analogy I like to use there is if, if you actually had literal chattel slaves on a plantation in chains and the the slave master comes and says to one of them okay you're going to be in charge of you know making sure that everyone's portion of you know their quota of crops for the day gets brought in and you're going to be in charge of distributing rations to everyone Uh, is the slave that he appoints to go and collect his cut of all the crops are they at fault and i would say no they're not the one doing it to everyone that's just the task they've been assigned by the one who's really oppressing them. And so I think that's kind of the position of this tax collector who comes to Jesus. He's saying, look, it's, it's the Roman authorities. It's the Roman legion that's oppressing us. And if they want to give you the task of, you know, being this functionary within that, that's okay. That's not a sin. You can do that, but don't rip people off for yourself in the process. Don't become like them by engaging in theft for yourself. The yeah, story of exactly. Zacchaeus where the he was a tax yeah. collector and he had robbed people, right? And, and he says, yeah. look, Lord, I'm going to give them double from even if I stole anybody. If I stole monies from everybody, yeah. I'm going to give them double, right? Yeah. So, yes, I would say it's not that it's not that Doug is stealing from people in New York by working for a salary from the New York government. Uh, that's, you know, we would need people doing Doug's job even in a fully privatized society. So I think that's not. That's not Doug stealing from the people of New York. That's Doug taking a job uh, that needs to be done, but is being, you know, so the, the so theft is, is already being you, done. So by you his would say, so you would say that boss. Jesus, so you would say Jesus was not the because there was a lot of messiahs before Jesus. When once we read the history, Jesus is yeah. not calling for rebellion, right? I think that was one of the issues yeah. that the Pharisees had, right? That they thought that when Messiah was going to come. He was going to throw yeah. off the Romans, but instead he preaches what today we know as the gospel, right? That the Messiah must die yeah. and then be, yeah. be, be crucified and then resurrect on the third day, right? And, and so, so the, yeah. the question is, he didn't call for, in, for a rebellious political religious movement, right? No, he didn't. But in the same breath, I'll say, I think he will. So I think when he comes back at the second coming of Christ, that right. happens. So all, so all the rulers are dethroned at the second coming. Well, theonomy, so, right? <laughs> well, the, the thing is that according to yeah, the, the scripture, it's theonomy, right? Are you a theonomist? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't use that term, no. That's just for listeners who are familiar with that term, that's a very subtle distinction I'd make there. But you know, people who so, know the, what theonomy theonom- is and have read Greg Barnson and all these kind of people who call themselves theonomists, I'm not totally on board with all of their so you thinking. Don't, you don't, so but you don't we would overlap. Believe, so... You, so so you're not a theonomist. So I'm thinking, you mentioned Kuiper. Like I've heard of Kuiper, the, the spheres yeah. of sovereignty, right? Yeah. God established the family, the government, uh, yeah. and, and every sphere is responsible for it for its own, right? Yeah. So according to that worldview, America has had that, right? Like in the beginning of America, the American Republic, the, the, the idea that separation of church and state, that Jefferson, many take Jefferson's words out of context, it's just that, that the fact that there shouldn't be no federal religion, right? There, there shouldn't be no, yeah. like, European, like the, like the Scottish had or the English had, where the yeah, Roman so no Catholics, Church of England, no Church Right, of exactly, right? But at the, but every state did have a religious test. Like, if you, if you study history, there was a lot of states that would burn people who had different doctrines. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think that was, that was a terrible, terrible thing thing they should not have done you know what i mean so so the thing is that in america we kind of have that worldview of like yeah we're not a theonomy we don't believe that everyone should submit but if everyone agrees to having god's law over them then people who have different views like for example homosexuality which is a hot topic in america the the bible calls us to stone them right if if we would submit to to god to even even paul's days with the Romans. So, you know what I mean? Like, you, that, yeah. That's very difficult. As far as, far as the taxes, how this do you square that with Levitical? This is one of the issues I have with the theonomists. Is that yeah, so how do you square that with Levitical? don't have a great way to So how do you square that with, like that. address the Levitical law where God commands Israel to pay taxes? 30% yeah, I believe so, so. 
yeah, so again, it's in the book. Uh, so if people want lots more detail on that, I, I do okay. a lot of stuff about taxes in ancient Israel in the book. And okay. uh, while I think of it, I'll make sure I put up like a, a yeah, discount post code window. for people listening to Monero Talk. So if you, if you want to buy the book, you can get it. Yeah, cheap. definitely post it. Post it up. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll do that it. once we hang out. Uh, we'll, we'll put it in the show okay. notes as yeah, well. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out, man. But it was not, it was Nick, not you could post, you could post You could post it here as a comment, Nick, and I could... Uh... You know, put in the nest or whatever. Hey, sure. man, was, I might do it. Nice, I might do it once we hang up, just so. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see if I because I don't want to be distracted from trying to talk to people. It, w- it was nice um, talking to you. Man. Okay, it was pretty cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, the the short version is that uh, the thesis of the book is that taxation is always a form of slavery, and I think that's true of the the taxes that are imposed by the uh, Levit- Levitical system in ancient Israel. So God actually says to the people of Israel, uh, "You won't be slaves to." people you know you won't be slaves to one another after certain conditions are met after the year of jubilee this kind of thing why why does god impose these you won't uh, i'm trying to trying to skip a lot of detail that is important two kinds of slavery just to be clear conquest slavery always wrong contract slavery kind of okay so a mortgage is kind of like a slave contract i'm gonna be a quote-unquote slave to the bank that is the language that is used in the Bible. I would prefer to make a clear right. distinction, but the Bible uses the word slave for both. So I could work for someone for X number of years to pay back a loan. It's called, in the, and, and in English, is indentured. Servitude. Exactly, exactly. So that's contract slavery, I've called it, to distinguish it from conquest slavery. So God says you won't be contract slaves to one another. Why? Because Israel are my slaves. There is a sense in which Israel are God's servants, and so they don't become servants to one another and so part of the way they express that is he, he takes a poll tax from them god imposes a tax on the israelites because he brought them out of slavery in egypt and they're now his servants um so i think even there that relationship of taxation is an expression of servanthood holds and that's that's how those temple taxes are justified and so you see in the new testament jesus goes to the temple and they want jesus to pay the temple tax matthew 17 and he says to peter i don't have to pay I am not a servant. I'm a son. I'm the son of God. Sons are not slaves in the household. Sons are free. I don't owe this tax. But Peter, you and I are going to pay it anyway just to avoid having a very difficult and complex conversation about that. So go get a fish out of the water and you'll find a coin for us both in its mouth. And that's what they did. But he's clear to make the point, because I'm not a servant the way that all of you are, I am the son. I shouldn't have to pay but I'm going to just to keep the peace. Well, well the thing is that Jesus Jesus was God, right? Yeah. You were supposed to pay him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's his house. He's the one that they're paying it to. <laughs> you got to pay me. <laughs> exactly. So that's, yeah, that's kind of what's going on with Israel and the temple tax, I think. P3, man. Great, great questions. Great pushback. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious before, before you, before you go P3, what, what do you think about Monero? Are you a Monero guy or are you, do you study Monero? I'm curious. Yes, in in terms of privacy coins, right? I think the technology is awesome. I think it it can be integrated in adding another extension of of, of these decentralized ledger, right? That allows to carry out business deals without considering the politics of the place. Like if I wanna if I wanna engage in a in in a uh, service between me and you, but our our own powers that be don't like each other, I should be able to contract with you, you know, at the local, like, for example, Russians, right, right now, we might potentially go to war with, at a national level, right, as an, if, if I can consider myself as an American, I would say that I would not want to trade with Russia, right, but at a, at a, at a, at a personal level, right, there's many Russians in the crypto space, I would buy a widget, right, uh, an app from them, and I would pay them in, in a digital currency, I don't have anything against any personal Russians at all, but and so I think decentralized or blockchain technology with the inability to to forge digital signatures that has opened the door to to just be human at the at a peer to peer level, and I think Monero allows for me to do that. For example, China, right? Let's say that I want to fund a Christian movement um, and, and buy Bibles for them. I think Monero is awesome because it allows for transactions to to be made anonymously and very difficult to, to trace, you know, not, not all of them could be, you know, there's a percentage that can be traced, but even then, right. We don't, it's very difficult and only super computers and, 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 and states can, can kind of detect that. 
And so I think Monero can help underground movements like the underground Christian church in China. So to me, that, that's, you know, Monero serves that purpose. Whereas Bitcoin, it's, it's an open ledger. Everyone can see where is it coming from and they can probably detect your IP address. So I think Monero serves, it exists for that function to carry out, you know, underground church movements that, that, that are found in China and, and the Chinese, you know, d- doesn't like. So I think Monero in that sense is positive. Totally. Been- Bible smuggling is a great example. Love of it, man. Good stuff, P3. Uh, great, great examples. Love it. Uh, Chill, what's going on? Hey, guys. Hey. How's everyone? Good, good, good. What do you got? I don't know. I just wanted to join in and uh, see what you guys are talking about. Oh, okay, okay. Was, uh, a pretty eventful day, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess you're referring to M ordinals, or I don't, I don't know. Or you're referring to the the wider marketplace. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on in the world. It seems to all be happening at an accelerating pace. Let me let me get a sub stack up here because I saw he had his hand raised. I don't want to. I don't think I skipped them. Go ahead, man. Thanks, guys. Amazing talk, first of all. Thanks, Nick. And uh, because you're so knowledgeable on the I had a question regarding more of a status type, so and more you categorize of people leaning towards the left. And I see a lot that they abuse the personal stories of Jesus to justify their own policies of collectivizing or forceful taxing people's work. So I wonder what's what your take would be in that in that scenario. I mean like I know it's not crypto related, but I see that a lot, especially under the posts of like conservatives or even libertarians. Somebody comes and says, Oh, what about Jesus? And he was talking about sharing, but they never acknowledge that it was about uh free uh free interaction among yeah. humans instead of being forced so uh in general i wanted to know what your take on yeah so again uh there's a bunch of stuff about this in the book it's a very thorough book uh there's a passage a lot of people go to in acts 4 where at the start of the church it says that the people in the church in acts had everything in common and they kind of they sold heaps of stuff and they brought it all into a common pot and shared it all and people will say oh that's you know the early church was practicing socialism internally um, there's yeah, there's a chapter towards the end of the book about that where I kind of argue, well, yes, they shared a lot of things, but it was all voluntary. And there's a story that follows that in Acts with Ananias and Sapphira where it gets made very clear that that was all entirely voluntary, never imposed by force, which is, I think, the defining feature of what makes it socialism. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the book about uh, kind of biblical defense of free markets in general and i think even in the life of jesus you see jesus telling stories that are very clearly uh encouraging and uh, condoning i guess private property so very non-socialist in that way he tells a story about um, it tells tells a parable about uh, a rich person giving a bunch of money to a bunch of their servants and saying hey go and invest this for me make a return on it and so he's sort of even encouraging people to uh, invest and collect interest and that kind of thing. It's you know, very much not something you would associate with socialism. Um, and that's just sort of seen as normal and ethical and fine uh, with Jesus. So I think it's it's a very, very difficult thing to argue that Jesus was a socialist or the early church was a socialist institution um, because if it's all voluntary, if you can actually opt out without being kicked out, then it's not socialism. It's just voluntary sharing. And that's, there's nothing uncapitalist about that either. Like I think people who are in that sort of anarcho-capitalist libertarian free market sense, you know, free markets have no problem with people sharing or even giving things away. That's fine. As long as it's all voluntary. That's why I would tend to use the term voluntarist rather than capitalist, because I think it's more important that exchanges are voluntary. That's, that's the defining feature. And so everywhere you see Jesus talking about trade in any way, it's always voluntary. Um, I don't know if that, does that help? Yeah, man, thanks. That's great. Thank you. Good stuff, good stuff. Tuxedo, what's going on, man? Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. And great name, by the way. Big Linux guy. Go Tux. 
Yes, uh, I love Linux. Uh, that that's a really cool argument. Um, I have definitely not heard that interpretation or that argument for before that um, uh, from the Bible that taxation is slavery because the norm is you know for Romans thirteen it's like oh yeah it says pay your taxes and then that's it and then there's nothing else to be said about that because no one else like goes any further. Yeah. But um, that was cool. You going out and like. Uh, comparing that to different parts in the Bible that actually talk about that, not just looking at that specifically. Uh, but I also had a question for you, because um, I am interested in your book. Uh, is there a way to pay for that in Monero? Uh, I have done that in the past. I haven't got an automated way to do that at the moment. I haven't got actually like a digital storefront hooked up to a Monero wallet. That's something I've, you know, I'm always meaning to do, but I have other more pressing projects and little kids, so I just I don't get to it. But if you send me a DM, I will happily accept Monero and send you a free copy. Um, I've done that. Okay, I've done that cool. with people before. Um, yeah, that's. And I even had one guy. He wanted a paperback, and he was desperate not to give any money to Amazon. Just didn't like Amazon, so he sent me Monero, and I shipped him a paperback from some other supplier. Uh, so yeah, happy to accommodate people that's if they want to pay with Monero, but I don't have an automated way to do that right at this moment. Just. I see. Yeah. No. That's. That's that's still nice that you will accept stuff from people, uh, which makes sense given that you uh, you seem to love Monero. <laughs> yeah, it'd be crazy to come on Monero Sorry. talk and not do that. Oh, cool! Thanks. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anybody else have a question for Nick based on what we've been talking about today? One last question. Hey, Nick, what do you think? You think you think crypto is the sign of the beast or what? <laughs> well, we can't buy ourselves. Is it going to be a smart contract that doesn't allow you to buy yourself? You don't serve the, 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 the Antichrist? Uh, if, it, you know, if that is actually a, a future thing that we're looking for, I think it's much more likely to be the CBDC. <laughs> a, a, smart, a smart evil contract. Yeah, something like that. But, you know, Monero, right, the whole point of Monero is how are they going to stop you from buying and selling? It's basically impossible to stop you, so whatever system they're going to use to stop people buying and selling without the mark. It's not going to be Monero because how are they going to stop you? Run your own node? I think, I think Monero should run like a, a marketing of like the, the digital coin of this antichrist uh, <laughs> uh, anti. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get away from the antichrist yeah. shop in Monero. Kind of onboard all the dispensationalists. I, yeah. <laughs> I say that with love. I, you know, uh, for, for the inside baseball theology people, I'm more of a historic pre mill guy rather than dispensationalist, but uh, my, yeah, my friends are all AML cool. and really don't expect any of that to happen. I hang out in reform circles where most people are amillennial, for those who know what that means. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a Calvinist, so, so I know what you're saying. Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. P, so P3, what's your take then on, on Bitcoin and, and uh, potentially being misused? Misused in what sense? Uh, in the sense that you know, states can use it to to surveil and control people. What's well, it's, um, it's like the internet, right? Like if you think about who created the the internet, it was DARPA, the the United States military. I think it's all it's along the same lines too, where you have a technology like the internet that has no one has in the beginning, right, of the internet in the nineteen seventies. During the Cold War, no one thought there was going to be a place where we share memes and any of that. It was just a, another way to, to communicate just in case the, the Soviet Union would knock our telephone poles. Hmm. So I think blockchain technology and you know smart contracts and all of that, we're, we're kind of living in that era where what you know many of the Ethereum developers talk about, it's, it's a technology that it's meant to be kind of agnostic, so it can be used for whatever. So I think we're, we're in that, at that stage where maybe the way that we're using blockchain technology right now to, to exchange digital currencies, maybe that's just like the beginning of the 1970s internet. And who knows what's going to be the future. So yeah. can, the government, can the government use it to spy on us? I, I think it is. I agree, with, I agree with Vitalik. I think digital currencies are globalist, right? It, it's just the essence of, of digital currency. It's, glo it's globalist by nature. Yeah. Um, but as far as the blockchain technology and the inability to forge digital signatures, what can that be used for? I have no idea, man. It would be like if I could, I would be predicting Twitter if I was born in 1970, right? But I, I don't think so. I don't. I don't know. I really don't know where this is going to take us off. I, as far as AR is being introduced with Meta, right, or Facebook, 
what what is that world going to look like, right? Like, mm. are we going to become more social? Because right now we're very antisocial with with the way you know Internet two point is. We're very antisocial. We we instead of instead of growing together and helping each other, everyone's playing you know uh, uh, one wins at the expense of all type of game theory. Will it become more cooperational? I don't know, man. I think AR is probably going to be the next the next catalyst in terms of the tech industry, but. And how does blockchain technology play into that? Or will the states be able to surveil us a lot more? You know, from a biblical perspective, you know, the end says that, yes, <laughs> we're, we're not going to be able to even sell and consume according to apocalyptic writing, right? Um, I think so. I think we're headed that way. I, to, to, if you ask me what's my, my meta perspective, I think we're heading towards this massive surveillance of the individual where if we don't worship uh, the entities of the state were going to be punished. I think that's the end goal of, of where we're headed. But as far as you know, the the horizon near to us, I don't know, man. Uh, maybe 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 America has another thousand years. It's kind of like the modern day Rome, and, and freedom will rise again, and we'll be able to trade a, a little bit more free with blockchain technology. You know, I don't know. I don't really know. I'll throw something out there. Something I'm I haven't got around to reading yet, but I'm definitely, definitely going to read is a book called The White Pill by Michael Malice, where he talks about the fall of the Soviet Union. And it's just, I think, meant to be an encouragement to us today that if things look bad to you now, they were so bad in the Soviet Union and it still fell and freedom broke out. And so just, you know, yeah, rumor no, that it can a, happen. That, that's so what I, I'm saving that's, that. That's what I get. When I, sometime when I'm really depressed, I'm going to make sure I, that's when <laughs> that's, I'm going to read it. That's what I... <laughs> Well, that's what I get when I read Paul. Like, Paul really thought that the world was going to end in his days. Like, he really did. Like, if, if you if you study Roman culture of those days, there was pedophilia. You know, yeah. the Caesars were fascist. Mm. There was no freedom of speech. Like, they never yeah. saw America, ever. They couldn't yeah. even imagine America. Exactly. You know what I mean? So that, that could happen, you know? Yeah. It was absurd for them to look at the world as they knew it and say, you know what? Like, Jesus has won and everything's changed. Like you looked around after, you know, a week after Jesus has gone and got nothing, nothing has changed, but actually everything yeah. has changed. And if you look at, if you look at history yeah. in 500 year increments, you see it's, it's taken over. So. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, we, we really can't. That's one thing that I've learned being in, in kind of, uh, you know, reading and seeing charts, like you cannot really know the future. Like no one was talking about silver, Silvergate and the Silicon Valley Bank mm. like a month ago. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody. Yeah. It just came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? To me that that kind of allows us to stay humble. Like you don't you don't really know tomorrow, you know. We we really cannot know. It doesn't matter what technologies we have, how much knowledge we have, we really cannot predict the future. That's I really sincerely believe it. Yeah, sure. Fantastic combos all around, guys. Uh, th this is great. Nick, man, thank you so much. Thanks for doing the interview. My pleasure. Thanks for jumping in to Spaces. P3, oh. man, thanks for jumping up and contributing. Uh, sure. would love to, uh, you know, I, I hope you stop by our shows more often. Maybe sure, have, you on, have you on as a guest at some point if you want to do that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that uh, stopped in. Substack, thank you for the questions. Chill as always. Thank you. Anybody that, that, that participated today, I greatly appreciate it. We do this sh these shows every week, uh, usually different times, different days, but it's kind of long form where I interview somebody and then we do a QA. and a And then we do a Monerotopia show every weekend, Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So you can check that out tomorrow. We're going to be talking about NFTs on Monero. Never thought talk talk about uh, you know sinning. It's the ultimate, perhaps the <laughs> ultimate sin. Um, so so that that should be a good convo. So guys, uh, jump jump in on that tomorrow if you, if you're around. It will be fun, um, and we'll explore what's going on uh, in Monero as always. Uh, just gonna shill Monero Topia real quick. We're doing a conference down in Mexico City in May. So anybody that's interested in participating, grab your tickets. And we're going to offer a virtual conference ticket soon just for those that can't make it down there so they could uh, participate live and, and watch all the talks. Monerotopia.com. All right, guys. Peace. Have a good weekend. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Nick. Thanks for having me, Doug. Cheers. Of course. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to monerotalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. 
If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.